Okay, it's official. Here we go. Session three of the 2022 Grantwood Country Forum. And I can't stop thanking the Cedar Rapids Public Library, the Animosa Library and Learning Center, Cedar Rapids Museum of Art, and the Iowa, Iowa Poetry Association enough for collaborating with us and uh, helping us with this next uh, second year expansion. It is just highly, highly um, exciting and meaningful to have you all participate. And uh, if you don't realize already, uh, we've called this this session uh, or this uh, excuse me this series this year friendships through words and art a journey into the life and legacy of Grant Wood and the land and people of Grant Wood Country, past present future. And this is for writers. It's for art, culture, history enthusiasts. And we're just so happy to to have everybody participating. Um, Tonight, you're going to look forward to hearing about Grant Wood's evolution and style from Sean Ulmer, director of the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art. And you, um, and first, we'll, uh, prior to his, his thoughts, we're going to be hearing from Don Terpstra of the Iowa Poetry Association about writing in response to art, uh, ekphrastics. So we're excited to have that happening. And I want to give a shout out that next week we'll be... Uh, talking all about the stained glass wonder that is the Veterans Memorial Window with Barbara Feller and Terry Van Dorsten, who are both here this evening. So we'll want to look forward to that. And I have for us a, just a few um, announcements and reminders. Uh, in case you didn't know, um, the Cedar Rapids Public Library has a YouTube channel where they post these sessions. And uh, just give them a few days to get each individual session up but they've been getting those posted to their channels. So you can revisit what, we, what we've what we talked about or pass it on to friends if um, if you're trying to get somebody involved and invite them or so just, this is an open forum. Um, feel free to use the chat function here this evening if you wanna reach out to each other, either privately or, or communicate with all of us. Um, so, and, um, and I, I do want to mention too, when we get started with our speakers, we'll want to just make sure we're muted uh, while they're speaking. Um, that would be helpful. Uh, some have expressed interest in last year's recordings from this forum. And I uh, just want to let you know that we're putting some thought behind that and we'll let you know about, more about that. Uh, that just came up today. Uh, that I was made aware that some folks would be interested in, in seeing those and we'll we'll see what we can come up with in that regard, working with Meredith on that. And then um, you may have gotten the email prior to this session tonight and there were lots of links in there. And, you know, of course you can go down the rabbit hole when it comes to creative writing resources out there on in Cyberville, but some, you know, not all resources are, are the same. And so um, just picked a few that um, I thought were meaningful. I know Don's gonna have some more tonight. We'll look forward to that. Um, I do wanna let you provide my email address this evening for you in case you'd like to uh, work with me directly, discuss anything, the process, um, anything that you might be working on to share at our reading session on the 28th of uh, February. Uh, as you're thinking about responding creatively. If you'd like to explore what that could be, your thoughts, just want somebody to bounce off of, um, I would be more than happy to chat with you by phone, text, uh, email, and uh, make you comfortable for, for including your words and your inspirations with us in upcoming session at our, our special reading session. Um, and, before we launch tonight, um, one of the things I wanted to have us think about was um, we're talking a lot about art and responding to art in our own ways. Um, there's a lot that's gone on with Grant Wood. And one of the things that um, we, we think about and, and our presenters I know have thought a lot about is is the intersections and the continuum of responses that people have 
to art, whether it's a personal uh, connection and response um, out of a particular cultural, contextual, you know, um, experience, uh, the scholarship that's involved, um, the art, art historians, and historians have points of view that um, come out of scholarship and primary sourcing. There's theories of art and artists' work where people take what they um, their, what they've researched and, and what they think and feel and they put a theory out there of what they, they think might be happening. And so there's just this whole continuum of subjective, objective, factual um, elements as we respond and think about what the speakers are presenting to us and where they're getting their information, what they're basing their thoughts and ideas on, what we're basing our reactions on. Um, I just think this is a wonderful opportunity to have so many um, truly, truly profoundly connected people to the Grant, the iconic Grant Wood landscape and be able to, to bounce off of each other as we're thinking about um, responding, whether personally or in a more um, rigorous, researched and scholarly manner as well. So there's room for all of that. And I just wanted to put that out there. So we kind of, you can kind of get a sense of where everybody might be coming from as they're springboarding off of our discussions and Grant Wood's art and legacy. So um, without further ado, whoops, what happened there? Um, I'll just leave this right here and I'll, uh, it, I'll stop sharing so that you can start sharing, Dawn. Um, let me get to that. There, there we go. And so I want, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, first introduce Bergstra, she, uh, who is a pushcart nominated poet and hobbyist beekeeper living in rural Iowa. Her poetry appears in current and forthcoming publications, including Verse Daily, Mom Egg Review, Midwest Review, The Acrostic Review, The Night Heron Barks, Quartet, Briarcliff Review, uh, and SWWIM. She is author of a chapbook, Songs from the Summer Kitchen, with Finishing Line Press, uh, very recent, 2021. Um, lovely, lovely words and, and poetry. She hosts and produces the monthly online poetry craft and reading series IPA Live for the Iowa Poetry Association, which just celebrated its 75th birthday, by the way. Beginning in, in April, she'll be facilitating a workshop in ecrastic poetry for the River Heron Review. Um, so boy, we've got lots of synergies going here. Dawn is a graduate of Iowa State University with a bachelor's degree in English and two master's degrees in anthropology as well as human development and family studies. She is now retired from a long career in marketing and communications. And Dawn, we are so happy to have you with us and can't wait to hear what you have to share. Elaine, thank you so much. This is such a, a, a fun series and thank you so much for inviting the Iowa Poetry Association uh, to be a part of this. This is just a, a pure pleasure and I look at the, the names of some of the people who are here this evening and shout out to the IPA members as well as everybody else. But it's just, it's really good to see, um, you know, uh, that organization um, in their active participation. So, yes. Uh, well, we're excited, you know, at IPA because for the first time this year in our Iowa Poetry Contest, we have an ecrastic poetry category. So um, we're, we're kind of getting uh, the bug to Elaine. So thank you for all you've done to help make these things, these kinds of things happen. So let's talk about ekphrasis. And we've, we've talked a lot about how do you say this word? Because when you talk about ekphrastic poetry uh, or ekphrastic writing, you know, we, we have the emphasis on a little bit different uh, part of the word, but ekphrasis, um, according to Google and according to um, others, uh, that's the way you say it, but you know, we live here in Iowa where we say Nevada and, you know, we, we, we have a little bit um, different pronunciation. So we'll understand when, when we talk about ekphrasis, it really, what it really means is description. It's a Greek word. 
So we're talking about descriptive poetry, but descriptive poetry that is in response, we've talked about to uh, a scene or more commonly a work of art. So something has prompted that description. Uh, work of art, uh, it can also be uh, you know, sculpture. We're gonna talk a little bit um, more about the other kinds of uh, inspirations we can use. But it, it's really, when you think about it, uh, through the imaginative act of narrating and also reflecting on the action, what's going on in that painting or what's that sculpture represent, uh, the writer, it's not always a poet, as we know, uh, the writer may amplify and expand its meaning. Give it a backstory, uh, give it some conversation. Uh, so it's really your through the writer's lens and then using all of the craft elements that the writer uses in their style of writing. So, um, you know, we talked about uh, a little bit about what this kind of conversation can be. And the writer interprets the art and creates this narrative to describe your to describe the writer's reaction. So that art can be visual art, as we're talking about with Grant Wood. But you know, we also have some other um, important and influential uh, individuals as part of the story of Grant Wood, and that would include Jay Sigmund and Paul Engel. So, what if you took some of their poetry and you found a way to respond? Uh, or some of the literature uh, that was written at the time that was about some of the, the same, uh, whether it's the same areas, same um, kinds of topics that, that Grant Wood was painting about. Um, you can also include music and movies uh, in, in terms of what you can write in a ecrastic response to. So when you think about writing uh, that ecrastic poetry, think about uh, you know, letting your imagination go, which you're doing anyway, but maybe you're writing in the voice of the characters or, or the object that is being um, portrayed. You know, kind of create this dialogue, whether it's a dialogue between the object and, and the writer, or you're going to see here, I, I have that John Stone poem uh, that you, you reference um, Elaine with some of the materials. Uh, you can you'll see that they're how these characters might be thinking or talking with each other. You can also think about writing in the voice of the artist. What was on the artist's mind uh, as the as the writer imagines that? Uh, you're going to imagine the story behind the art. I include an example of an ecrastic poem that I wrote, and it's got the a backstory that is nowhere in this in this piece, but it, it it's uh, it's compelling. It really, it, because the artwork is compelling. Um, and also you can directly address the artist, you know, thinking about uh, their process or the subject. So, you know, and there's many other, many other styles or many other uh, things that you can do to make this an, uh, a very compelling piece of acrostic writing. So I'm gonna start here, uh, just talking about this classic. I think everybody uses this uh, piece, Ode to a Grecian Urn by John Keats. And when we think about, uh, you know, what is he doing is, is he really is, he's addressing this, this object. He's, he's talking, you know, in that first stanza, what men or gods are these? What maidens lost? What mad pursuit? What struggle to escape? What pipes and timbrels? What wild ecstasy? And then he goes on to imagine, and uh, it, and he he really is reflecting on what's going on in this um, the that middle section with where the if you turn that vase around or that burn around is uh, is maybe you can you've seen pictures um, you know there's just a variety of subjects on there and and he's he's creating this this story about who these people are. Uh, what are they doing? And, uh, it, you know, it's, it's a classic. And uh, I think when we think about it, classic poetry, this is one that always comes to mind. The Starry Night by Anne Sexton. Um, you know, there's, there's an interesting challenge right now in the classic review. I'm going to just uh, share a little bit about that here in a moment. But it's to write about this piece. Uh, by Van Gogh. So we've got The Starry Night by Anne Sexton, and I, and I am going to read through this. This is just, you know, it's a short piece. The town does not exist except where one black-haired tree slips up like a drowned woman into the hot sky. The town is silent. 
The night boils with 11 stars. Oh, starry, starry night. This is how I want to die. It moves. They are all alive. Even the moon bulges in its orange irons to push children like a god from its eye. The old unseen serpent swallows up the stars. Oh, starry, starry night. This is how I want to die. Into that rushing beast of the night, sucked up by that great dragon, to split from my life with no flag, no belly, no cry. So Anne Sexton uses some repetition in there uh, to, to create some additional interest or to draw attention. She uses some of the detail of the painting, um, loving the, you know, the black haired tree slips up like a drowned woman. Um, great metaphor there. Uh, and, you know, just really using some of the, the pieces from this painting to create this very effective short poem. Man Without Shadow. This is after Excursion into Philosophy by Edward Hopper, and Hopper's paintings are just so compelling. So this is a contrapuntal poem, and I'm not really going to get into that, but I just wanted people to know that you can write any style poetry. Um, you know, you can write haiku, you can write a pantoum, you can write a gazelle, you can write a sonnet, uh, and, and still consider it to be, you know, an ecrastic response. It doesn't have to be free verse, it, you know, it doesn't have to be one thing or another. So I share this example just because it, it is a contrapuntal, it's different, but it, it also uses this backstory in that first stanza, which is that first column, uh, that's nowhere in the, the, the picture. And so it just really um, takes liberties with what's going on between the characters. Uh, what, how, is, how is the man suffering? How is the, the woman um, almost like an afterthought in this, uh, how the use of the shadow and the, the open window. So anyway, there's lots you can do with these, these pieces. I have this uh, response, the, this poem by John Stone. So Elaine included um, a link to college students' responses to uh, poetry written by other, uh, by poets. Um, and, and so these college students providing kind of a critique, uh, what they thought the, the writer was, was thinking about. So in American Gothic, John Stone, who's a um, poet, essayist, lecturer, and he was a cardiologist. Uh, he was a professor of cardiology at Emory University, which is really interesting. And you think about, why did he write this poem? Um, but it really does take in this scene of American Gothic, and he's just imagining what's going on around these two people who are standing there posing for this portrait. And it starts out with just outside the frame, there has to be a dog, chickens, cows, and hay, and a smokehouse where a ham in hickory is also being preserved. So he uses a really interesting style. He doesn't use any punctuation. He uses capitalization uh, just to indicate the start of a new sentence, new thought. Um, and so you also see then toward the end of the poem, and this is not, this, this poem was written in a long skinny column, which I could not put on this PowerPoint slide. So that second column is just me taking liberties. So you can see this poem. Um, but you know, in the, the second uh, uh, column there, He's, he's uh, kind of inside the heads of, of uh, the two people in the, the painting. Um, you've got the man, he's, uh, instead, he's talking about these two, um, two people. Instead, they linger here within the patient fabric of the lives they wove. He asking the artist silently, how much longer? And worrying about the crops. She no less concerned about the crops, but more to the point just now, whether she remembered to turn off the stove. So very ordinary thoughts, kind of this ordinary, ordinary setting in the mind of the poet. And yet this, this third most recognizable painting in the world is produced from uh, this ordinary time. So a very fascinating poem by John Stone. I know we've been talking about poetry and I, I know that's, that's 
you know, somewhat of an emphasis, but it's not. I mean, there's, there's lots of ekphrastic flash fiction out there. And I have this piece here called The Wild Boy. And I uh, sent this to Meredith, this uh, PowerPoint presentation, and I have a link to the Coil magazine. So you can read this uh, in total. The ekphrastic is re response is in, uh, it's in response to this picture um, called Exasperated Boy with Toy Hand Grenade. And there is this piece of uh, uh, backstory of uh, flash fiction here. And if you're interested in that kind of writing, I would definitely encourage you uh, to take a look at this presentation afterwards and uh, link to that in COIL. It's also, I mean, if you wanna just Google uh, COIL Magazine, The Wild Boy, um, that edition is December 8th, 2020. We've also talked about poetry and response, acrostic poetry in response to poetry. And here's a piece uh, by John Sibley Williams, where he's discussing Cesar Estrada Chavez um, using uh, some of the poetry of Robert Frost. And I think that you'll recognize some lines where two roads diverge, an orchard rest its throat in migrant hands, body reaching into another body. So. Uh, Cesar Chavez was a um, you know, famous um, uh, leader for migrants' rights uh, back in the 60s and 70s. Um, you can see also how uh, Sibley has taken um, some uh, direct quotes from some of the lines uh, right here in particular. He has um, italicized this to indicate it came directly from that piece. So he's combining both the life of uh, Chavez and also um, uh, cross poetry, and it's a really fascinating exploration. He's done this several other times, um, and you might see some of these other pieces uh, titled in the same way. So um, very interesting response. There's some other examples I'm going to show you as soon as I'm out of the PowerPoint. I have it pulled up uh, on, the, uh, on the web. Um, Obad with Burning City by Ocean Vong. I think a lot of you who are familiar with poetry know his work. Um, Ocean Vong is a, uh, he, he was living in Vietnam during the fall of Saigon and uh, he uses the uh, um, lyrics from White Christmas, which was a code that was played if the invasion of Saigon was going to happen. It was played um, at, uh, I want to say, was, a, was it around Christmas? I don't remember. But um, he interweaves the, the lyrics of, um, uh, of this Irving Berlin piece um, throughout the poem, and it's very powerful. Um, I also have a link to a YouTube video by Dinez Smith. It's a performance of Dinosaurs in the Hood, which is a response to Jurassic Park and the pursuit of happiness with Will Smith. Um, and it's a, it's a four minute piece. And it's, you know, Dinesh Smith is just a really well-known spoken word performer, uh, as well as just a really well-known poet uh, from Minneapolis. So if you have a, an opportunity to listen to this afterwards, um, yeah, do it. It's just, it's really amazing. So um, I, gosh, Elaine, thank you so much for, you know, providing those resources. And it's, <laughs> you look out there on the, on the web and it's like, you know, a bit here and a bit there, but there are a couple of places you can go and just kind of see all, all at once, you know, kind of like a, a big picture view of what, um, what kinds of work, uh, you know, is being published out there in the literary world. Um, we, the Ekphrastic Review is a really great source for not just poetry, and it's really trying to um, broaden the scope and include more uh, flash and microfiction pieces. And I, I have right here a little bit what it's about. It's an online journal devoted entirely to writing inspired by visual art. So, um, you know, some of the, the poetry stuff that I showed you and movies, eh, maybe not. Um, our objective is to promote ekphrastic writing, promote art appreciation and experience how the two strengthen each other and bring enrichment to every facet of life. So um, they, you know, this, uh, this is a really interesting journal because every two weeks they have uh, a different prompt. And it just so happens that the acrostic prompt that's up this week 
is uh, Starry Nine <laughs> so, uh, over here on the right. So if you want to try your chops at this, uh, go out and look at all of the other challenges. They have them. They have everything out there that uh, I think that they've done for, for several years on the uh, acrostic challenge part. And you can see what kinds of pieces they are uh, looking for. They also um, publish a podcast called Tercets where they have discussions about some of these uh, pieces that they're getting. Um, they also uh, will post longer term challenges where they want you to buy their, their book. So, you know, they're, they, might, they might want you to purchase something if you're interested in that and take part in this, uh, you know, maybe it's a six week challenge where you're going to be writing about, here's like, you know, 50 portrait or 50 paintings by women. And here's, you know, you can respond to any of them. You can respond to, you know, some of them in a group. It's up to you. So um, that's fascinating what they're doing. And um, you can also just enter if, you, if you've written a really interesting acrostic uh, piece, um, include the, the artwork as well, as, obviously, as, as your piece, send it to them. They're much slower to respond to those than they are to their challenges. Um, this is kind of a one-person show, I'll just have you know that. So sometimes those uh, responses are very slow in coming, but when it's to some of these, these challenges, she's responding very quickly. This is a, um, a publication out of Canada, and it's really worth your time to just, you know, sit out there and look at, you know, the different approaches to writing acrostic uh, responses. It's amazing. There's another one I just stumbled upon um, called Oratone. It's a fledgling um, po acrostic poetry only um, piece, uh, literary journal. It's been around less than six months. But I tell you what, it's run by a woman who is an associate editor for the Kenyan Review, which is one of the most respected literary journals uh, in this country. And um, she's trying to make her own mark. And she, there's a, a couple of them working on this, but um, I've, I've been very impressed by what I see so far. So if you like writing acrostic poetry, let me turn you on to this one. Um, so yeah. Uh, and just to give you a little bit of an idea, uh, I'm going to go down to the second uh, paragraph there. We want poems that cleave memory, the experimental and the timely, pretentious and unpretentious art. The A24 film, everyone pretends to understand your favorite Animal Crossing soundtrack from childhood. Tell us how uh, Caravaggio's Judith beheading Holofernes, I'm not sure if I said that right, sorry, and Mitski's Working for the Night kept you up at night. So, you know, they're really looking for something a little bit more uh, on the edge, and it, it's fascinating. Um, and you would also find in almost any literary journal uh, that they're going to publish acrostic pieces. That's just, you know, if you've got a, a good piece of writing that's a, a, an acrostic response, um, most literary journals are going to publish it. So it's not just these specialty piece places, um, but if you're looking for just, you know, you want to see what other acrostic writers are doing, these are two really wonderful resources. Another one I'd let you know about, and this, this is happening all the time, it's Rattle's Acrostic Challenge. Rattle is one of the top literary journals in the country, or internationally, really. And every uh, couple of, I don't know if it's every month. Yes, I think it's every month. They are putting up a, a challenge for you to respond to. So there's two ways to respond. One is to, you're going to go check out the website and see what the, the image is that you, know, the, you could currently respond to. And at the same time, you're going to see ecrastic responses from previous competitions. So that way you're looking at acrostic writing, right? And you're, you're trying to figure out what works, what doesn't. Um, so that's that. But the other way to do it, which I think is really interesting, is they have a private Facebook page um, and <clears throat> where they have the acrostic challenge out there. And um, this is their, their fun um, you know, little profile shot there, or cover shot. But down at the bottom is a piece uh, in, with the, the, the boy in the red balloon. Um, this 
piece, uh, this is uh, the, the poem that's on the right, um, is the one of the winning responses. And they always pick two winning responses. One is picked by the editor of Rattle and the other is picked by the artist. So um, those are always really interesting. And, and the way that you enter it is you just do something that you're told never to do if, um, if you wanna get your piece published. And that's, you take it and you paste it uh, in, uh, as part of your post uh, in Facebook. But again, this is a private group, so it's not gonna get out. Um, and then that's where they judge it from. So you can either submit it in a traditional way or you can uh, do it this way. So uh, lots of options um, for that one, but uh, you know, you'll see some really amazing writing. That's one of the reasons I like to go out there. It's just, you know, what a great piece and you know, what a, what a fascinating response. Um, I am gonna stop sharing that, but I'm gonna come back um, Elaine and share those uh, websites if I can find them. Here. And that's a big old if. And while, while you're looking for those, Don, mm -hmm. I'll let everybody know that it's not too late to join the Iowa Poetry Association and submit to their annual contests, which have many categories. The deadline is actually the 28th. So whatever you would write to submit to them, ekphrastically related to Grant Wood, for example, um, uh, they've got a number of categories. So you could go to their website and and see and including you know humorous verse first time entrance poems for children haiku traditional forms a new general category in honor of uh, the recently passed Lucille Morgan Wilson and uh, and plus the ekphrastic challenge with a particular image that you respond to so yeah. that's happening <laughs> as we speak Thank you for mentioning that, Elaine. And um, for the first time I, ever, as far as I know, um, we've made a members only category and that category this time is the expressive category. So um, anyway, but I just wanted to take a few minutes and show you, uh, this is the Acrastic Reviews website. And, you know, it's, it's a little bit, it, you know, if I was designing a website, I'm not sure I'd organize it this way, but there's just lots to, to look at here, so much to look at. And I would just, and, and there's, if you want to look at it and look at different types of acrastic writing, plan to spend some time here because it's, it's fascinating. It's, it's really, really good stuff. You'll find the acrastic writing challenges, uh, current and past. You'll find a link to the Tercets podcast. The Tercets, you can find it, you know, if you've got an Apple device, I'm sure it's out, you know, anyway, I follow it. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot out there. And then, you know, this is what their submission policy is. Um, sometimes they have contests and prizes. They also um, are, participate in push cart nominations and best of the net, best small fictions. Uh, so if you're interested in those types of opportunities, uh, it's, it's out here. So, um, yeah. Uh, the other one I wanted to just show you is Oratone, uh, just a really beautiful, sumptuous site. Um, and then they just, you know, talk a little bit about themselves, how to submit, um, and yeah, you can see, you'll be able to see a little bit more of, you know, their, their very few past um, issues. Here's what that uh, rattles, um, classic writing challenge looks like. If you were going to go look at the website, and here's the submission deadline, February 28th, and you would use um, submittable, which is, um, submissions uh, platform uh, in order to submit it. And you could, you know, read a little bit more about some of the past contests and link to the poems in the piece. Uh, I mentioned um, Obad, The Burning City uh, by Urshan Vaughn. So this tells the, the, the story behind uh, South Vietnam, uh, April 29th, 1975. Armed Forces Radio played Irving Berlin's White Christmas as a code to begin Operation Frequent Wind, the ultimate evacuation of American civilians and Vietnamese refugees by helicopter during the fall of Saigon. And so you can see here in italics, he's got, he weaves in uh, the lyrics uh, 
in this piece and his, his, his writing is just beyond, it's just amazing. So um, if you're interested in reading that, I, I have a link to it in that PowerPoint presentation, as well as a link to Dinosaurs in the Hood. Um, so uh, this is you know, from Button Poetry and check it out if that's something that interests you, so. That's a really dynamic um, uh, spoken word site. So I'm glad you, you mentioned that, Dawn. Dawn, thank you so much for all those rich resources and just the well thought out um, presentation of, I mean, I can't, I can't imagine going deeper in the acrostic than you just did for us. So if that doesn't, that doesn't um, inspire people to submit things or do things, I will be shocked. Let me tell you, yeah. I'll be and shocked, I tell you. You know, <laughs> we're all creative people. I think that's why we're here. And so if you've ever imagined, you know, a backstory to your, your, your favorite Grant Wood piece or Jay Sigmund uh, poem or Paul Engel poem, boy, uh, let it let it rip. <laughs> right. And and folks, don't be afraid to uh, chat Dawn if you need to. Absolutely. Um, yeah. um, I would like to. So um, she's 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 go to, let me tell you. Well, I uh, thank you again so thank much, you. Dawn. Absolutely. It was fun. Great, great. And uh, look forward to to hearing maybe hearing some things from you throughout the, the series. That would be fun. Thanks. Um, Hint, hint. Um, next, <laughs> next up, we have, I'm really excited to have kind of this pairing of presentations tonight, because I think they just lend themselves to each other so nicely. And can't wait to let you know a little bit more about Executive Director of the Cedar Rapids Museum, Sean Ulmer. My goodness, I love the fact when I'm going to kind of read your bi his bio to you, I get to say art and curator about a thousand times. I think it's great. Um, so prior to coming to the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art, um, he served as a curator of collections and ex exhibitions um, at CRMA for nine years before becoming the executive director, excuse me. So he came out of the curating side. He uh, more than 25 years of curatorial experience, including organizing over 120 exhibitions and acquiring numerous works of art. He's also responsible for several exhibition catalogs, including Uncommon Threads, Contemporary Artists and Clothing, Nature Transformed, Wood Art from the Bolin Collection, Betty Saar, Extending the Frozen Moment, Clary Ilian, A Potter's Potter, and Diego Lazansky, Paintings, Drawings, Prints. Um, prior to his position at uh, CRMA, he was Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art at the University of Michigan Museum of Art. And prior to that, at the Herbert F. Johnson Museum of Art at Cornell University, where he had a broad curatorial portfolio as Assistant Curator of Painting and Sculpture. His five years at Cornell was preceded by his position as exhibitions coordinator at the Ohio State University's Wexner Center for the Arts. And he received his BA in art history from the University of Toledo, Toledo Museum of Art, and an MA in art history from Ohio State University. So, oh, artful, Sean, please welcome and help us understand a little more about Grant Wood. <laughs> oh, thank you, Elaine. Appreciate it. I'm so thankful that you invited me to join you. Um, and I've got lots of wonderful things, I think, for you to take a look at. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. Okay. Can, can you see that a couple nods of the head would be great? Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. So, all right. So, um, now, Elaine asked me to talk about Grant Wood's evolution and style. Um, and, the, and the title she gave me to kind of work with was Grant Wood from Impressionism to, to Regionalism, um, which is great. Uh, and, and we're going to look at that. Um, but before we kind of dive in, I just wanted to take a moment um, to talk about the word regionalism, because um, uh, that is the term that many people use uh, uh, to describe Grant Wood's mature style. Uh, the style that really comes from the late 1920s um, and, and, uh, and, and in through the 30s until his death in 1942. 
And so, um, but it's not really a, a stylistic term. Uh, at the museum, we talk about Grant Wood's evolution from impressionism to his mature style. Um, because regionalism is, is less of a stylistic term and, and more of a term that kind of describes subject matter. Um, when one thinks of the three major regionalists, Grant Wood, Thomas Hart Benton, and John Stuart Curry, uh, and you put their paintings side by side, there really isn't a whole lot stylistically that links um, the two of them, uh, the three of them together. Uh, if you had them, you would be able to differentiate between, um, between them all. Um, instead, what links them is their uh, interest in representing the Midwest, and in particular, the rural Midwest, um, whether that is rural, uh, scenes of rural life or, or scenes of farm life. And that's what really is regionalism um, per se. Um, stylistically, they are quite distinct from, from one another. Um, and, uh, and so uh, in the museum, we kind of refer to regionalism as this interest in, in the Midwest, which was very novel and very, very important and a, and a really valuable addition um, to, to the history of art, because prior to that, you know, really artists were encouraged, um, especially artists who were, who were doing landscape, which, which regionalism focuses a great deal on, um, uh, to, to do grand, grand images, uh, images of the Rockies, images of the Adirondacks, if you couldn't get to the Rockies, um, or the Catskills, um, or crashing waves uh, on a seashore. If you're going to do cityscapes, it could be a beautiful harbor with with uh, a lovely town behind it, or uh, or it could be a scene of, of, of active and vivacious New York, something along those lines. Um, the the regionalists thought very differently. They felt very much that that the images from their own backyard uh, of Iowa, of Kansas, of Missouri, uh, for those three artists in particular. Um, were just as important as grand scenes of the, of the Rockies. Um, and, and they really elevated that. And that was really, really unique, really um, important addition to the history of American art. Um, and, and also when you think of regionalism, capital R, you're largely talking about those three artists, but there are all kinds of regionalisms happening at the same time across the country. There is something called the Great Lakes Regionalists, um, which is a group of artists loosely connected who are all interested in imagery from around the Great Lakes. There is a California regionalism. There is a Southwest regionalism. These are all happening. But one, when one thinks of regionalism um, uh, with a capital R, thinking largely of Grant Wood, Thomas Harpin, and John Stuart Curry. Um, and so it really is about more about subject matter than style. And what Elaine wanted me to kind of deal, uh, dive into is how in Grant Wood's life, do we go from this feeding of the chickens from 1917, 1918 to that work from 1930? Really in the course of 12 years, a very, very relatively a small period of time. And there are many possible influences that encouraged Grant Wood um, to make this evolution in style. And that's what I wanna kind of dig into tonight. But I want to start kind of at the beginning, uh, and that is with um, his land, his paintings um, from the late teens, from the late 19 teens. Now, uh, as you probably know, Grant Wood was always artistic. Um, he was artistic as a boy. Um, we have wonderful drawings uh, in ink and pencil, um, pastels, even a few watercolors uh, from his time when he was in middle school and high school. And the moment he graduates, High school, he is off to Minneapolis to study metalwork. Um, and it is there these studies um, with Ernest Batchelder for a year, comes back to Cedar Rapids, continues in uh, metalworking, eventually finds, him, finds his way over to the Kalo Silversmith shop just outside Chicago, branches off, does his own, uh, his own shop, which doesn't last long, uh, largely because there isn't a great demand for luxury silver goods in the middle of World War I, comes back to, to Cedar Rapids. And he really, although he's taking classes, a few classes in these places, he's really teaching himself how to paint. Um, so when you look at Grant Wood's paintings, um, keep in mind that he is, is really taught himself 
Um, and when he launches into paintings, which he does in the late teens, um, he is uh, under the sway of the predominant painting style in America, which is American Impressionism, um, which is an offshoot of French Impressionism um, um, that American artists who went abroad, um, went to Europe, saw Impressionism, brought that style back with them, and it catered to a collector base, largely on the East Coast, who had also traveled um, to Europe and had seen Impressionism and was wowed by it and wanted, started collecting uh, European Impressionists, French Impressionists in particular, um, and, and the American Impressionists were um, uh, uh, to, uh, tapping into that market. Um, uh, it was just a really, really pervasive style in both Europe and the United States. Um, impressionism is characterized um, by several factors. One is a very loose painterly application of paint, a pigment, um, uh, and where you're really trying to create just an impression of a particular moment in time. And there is, um, in, in all sort of impressionist works, um, there is a fascination with um, and the pursuit of light. Um, and as you can look at these four works um, from Grant Wood in the late teens, you can see that light really is the subject of each and every one of them. Um, feeding the chickens in the upper left from 1917, 1918. Um, the horse traders in the upper right uh, from 1918. Uh, the 3178 um, in the lower left from 1918. And old sextants place. Oh, no, that's the old stone barn. Sorry, uh, wrong, that was the wrong image. I didn't want to put that on. I wanted to put in um, old Sexton's place. So, um, but this from the old stone barn from, uh, from the same period from 1918. Um, and you can see that it is this flicker of light, this momentary capturing of, of light, knowing, as all Impressionist artists did, both French and American, that in two seconds, the scene would change. Um, and, and it changed because the light changed. Uh, whether that was the movement of a tree, changing the dappling of light um, uh, uh, on the surfaces, um, or, or was just the fact that a cloud would come in front of the, the sun um, and the light quality would change. Um, it was important to capture that momentary impression, um, which is really what kind of gives the movement its, its ultimate name. And I have taken the liberty of, of grabbing, oops, hang on a second, of grabbing a few details for you. So you can see what I mean by kind of having a painterly style, what we call a painterly style, which is this loose brushwork um, that you see here, a very uh, a small detail um, from feeding the chickens. You can see how loosely painted in those chickens are. It reads from a distance perfectly well, but when you get up this close to it, these uh, individual uh, pigments dissolve into individual brush strokes, um, and that's really kind of a hallmark um, of, of Impressionism. Um, or here from the horse traders, you can see in the foreground in particular, the way Grant Wood has, has put in the grass um, with, you can see every really stroke of, of paint. Um, you see the artist's hand very much um, on the surface. And here, details from Old Sexton's Place, which you didn't get to see the overall on, on I apologize, um, where you can see how really, really loosely he painted um, the, the elements in this, in this composition. Um, and, you know, all the while, what he's really trying to capture is light. That is the true subject of his work. Now, he, this, this interest in Impressionism is reinforced when he and Marvin Cohn go to Paris in the summer of 1920. Um, and uh, if you want to know exactly where um, they went, um, we, uh, there is a recording on the museum's YouTube uh, uh, page where I read Grant, uh, Marvin Cohn's diary and illustrate it with paintings from both Marvin Cohn and Grant Wood of their summer um, in, in Paris in, in, 19, in 1920. Um, but going to Paris in 1920 and seeing French Impressionism firsthand um, really reinforced Grant Wood's interest in Impressionism. Um, and here are scenes from Paris or the environs of Paris uh, in, in the upper left, Saint Etienne du Mont, um, in the upper right, the Fountain of Lothaire in Chateauneuf, which is a suburb of Paris. Lower left, old and new, or also known as a corner cafe. Um, and then on uh, the right, uh, lower right, misty day, fountain of the observatory. And 
having a piece like that, Misty Day, entitled in the way that it was, and we know titles are really, really important, especially when it comes to writing, uh, it is very, very much in line with Impressionism. Um, uh, French Impressionists and then their American counterparts were very interested in times of the day and in seasons and in weather conditions because this these things all affected light quality and light was really the supreme uh, um, subject for impressionists so um so misty day fountain of the observatory which is a tiny little uh, uh kind of add-on um to the luxembourg gardens in, in in paris um is really about the mood that a misty day creates um and he's trying to capture that mood um in this really really tiny painting um, and I have some details. Oops, I keep doing the wrong, the wrong clicker there. Okay, some details of, of Misty Day. Now, Misty Day is a tiny painting. I mean, it's it's like this. Uh, it's on view at the museum. If you come to the museum, um, it's a small painting. I'm going to, you know, guess that I don't know the dimensions. Maybe six by nine inches. It's a small painting. Um, but you can see in these details how loose the brushwork is. The detail on the right is of the horses in in the Carpo Fountain. Uh, that, that, he's, that he's representing there. Um, or here, at the very base of the Carpo Fountain, there are tiny little um, metal turtles that are spraying water out of their mouths. And that is what you see right above his signature, is a detail of that turtle. You can see how very, very loose um, that brushwork is. He goes back to Paris and a quick trip to Italy in 1923-24 when he takes a sabbatical from teaching um, and decides to take classes at the Académie Julienne in Paris. Um, so he's back in Paris and he's, and he's looking again um, at French uh, Impressionism. Uh, and these are um, examples from his trip um, then. Uh, on the left, uh, up the left is the runners from 1924. Um, uh, and then in the center is the Fountain of the Medici in the Luxembourg. Both of those are in the Luxembourg Gardens, also from 1924. And then uh, the upper right is Luxembourg Gardens from 1923. Um, that piece you can find at the Figuier Museum, um, if you happen to be over there. And you can see he's still very much, again, very much interested in the loose brushwork. Here, a beautiful detail um, of the runners. Uh, and it's right out in front of the Orangerie. The Orangerie um, was just uh, a, a building on, uh, in the Luxembourg Gardens next to the Luxembourg um, Palace. Uh, and, and you can see how wonderful um, these colors are and, and how they really vibrate um, being side by side in the way that, that he has, he has um, put them down. Um, or here, a, de a detail um, of the Medici Fountain, um, which looks exactly like this still. Um, in, um, uh, in, in, in the Luxembourg Gardens uh, and, and gives you a good sort of sense of, again, how loose his brushwork um, uh, is. And then he returns in 1926 um, to France. Uh, he has an exhibition um, at the Gal Galerie Carmine in Paris, which he thinks will launch his career. It does not. Um, unfortunately, um, but he is fascinated with doors and doorways at this particular moment in his, in, in his, in his career. Um, uh, and it's sort of uh, not surprising, he, he's just, you know, uh, created his studio back um, in Cedar Rapids uh, with its unique door. Um, and, he's, and he goes uh, into the small towns around Paris um, and captures all of these wonderful images of, of doors and doorways. And you can see he's still very, very much under the sway of Impressionism, 26, you know, we're getting closer and closer to that 1930 uh, date, uh, and we still have a long way to go before we get to something in the style of American Gothic. Hang on just a second, keep pushing the wrong button, my apologies. Um, and here's some details um, of, uh, of the doorway. Uh, I, I should have identified the works, I apologize. Um, uh, the Old Crest Parachute from 1926 in the upper left, which is a, a brand new work uh, to our collection. Uh, in the center, the Porte du Clocher in saint Emilion from 1926. And then uh, the right, um, the doorway from Parachute in uh, 1927. And here are details from the doorway um, that you see. You see just really slathering um, the pigment on. 
uh, which reads totally, totally beautifully, you know, from a distance. When you get close to it, you see it just, it all begins to break, break apart. Now, this takes you through the 20s and his fascination throughout the 20s, um, or at least up until 1926, uh, with Impressionism. But at the same time, he's doing other things which are not really uh, uh, tied up in Impressionism. And it's important to take a look at some of those things because it helps to explain how his style changes from Impressionism to his, to his mature style. Um, and there are a series of things that he's doing in the 20s at the exact same time that he is uh, fascinated with Impressionism. Here, Adoration of the Home from 1921-22. Um, this was a commission. This was something that was um, created for Henry Ely to advertise a new subdivision he was creating where the city met the country, which is why you see this wonderfully classically inspired uh, woman in, this, in, in, in the center holding up a model home, basically. Um, and this was to serve a, as a tiny, if you will, billboard for the project. And it hung for a little while on a model home that had been built in downtown Cedar Rapids so that businessmen on their lunch hour could tour the model home to see whether or not they wanted to buy one in Ely's uh, uh, subdivision. Uh, and so um, this was briefly um, hung there. Uh, so it really had to serve as a billboard. It needed to read. It could not be full of lots and lots of loose brush strokes because it would not read as well. Now there are elements of this piece when you get up close to it that are um, full of loose brushwork. Um, but on the whole, it needed to read like a billboard reads. It needed to communicate. It had a different function. Um, and Grant Wood was responding to the requirements of his uh, of his commissioner. Here too, um, in the imagination Isle Freeze that he created with his students um, in 1924, there was a different set of parameters at play and they were very, very important. He wanted to create this wonderfully long freeze that the students would fill in with color, um, but the students of course were young. Uh, they didn't necessarily have his artistic talent. Um, and so the composition needed to be simple. It needed to be almost, you know, kind of filled in like a coloring book, if you will. Um, and so um, because the needs were different, just like with the uh, Adoration of the Home, because the needs were different, he had to adopt a different approach. This uh, piece has no painterly brushstrokes in it at all. It really it needed to communicate in a different way and it needed to because it was being filled in by students. It was being filled in by students. And here, another commission, this is the Cherry Series from 1925. Um, this was a commission from JG Cherry Company um, to create a series of, of images that would be taken to trade shows to show prospective customers the kind of work that JG Cherry Company could do. Uh, here's a, an overall uh, view. Um, and here, uh, the coil welder, uh, one of the more famous images from, um, from that series it needed to communicate. What was important here were the coils. That's the subject matter here. Um, these were used, as I said, in a trade show. You needed to show the prospective buyer what you were able uh, of creating. Um, and so, um, so, the, so the machinery is critically important to represent properly. Here, the painter. And you see a gentleman painting uh, this large piece of machinery, which would have been used or been necessary um, in dairy works. I mean, that's basically what the JG Cherry Company created were with products for dairy processing. Um, and so here the painter, now, even in this regard, Grant Wood was allowed certain latitude. So when you zoom in on, on the, the, paint, the painter here, um, you can see that there's still a small element of loose brushwork. Um, as a part of the overall composition. But the product, the product that the Cherry Company was selling had to be completely readable. It had to function um, as if you were kind of a, a, a marketing tool um, because that's what the commission um, was all about. 
And in the later 1920s, another thing was happening to Greg Wood, which also caused him to begin to alter his style. And that was a series of commissions for portraits. And just like the Adoration of the Home or the Cherry series, Grant Wood needed to please his buyer. He needed to please the person who was commissioning him. So in the later uh, 1920s, um, Grant Wood started to do a series of portraits. And, and generally speaking, people who commission an artist to do a portrait wanted to kind of look like the person that they're commissioning the, the, the portrait of. Um, and so you are oftentimes given some latitude, um, but it really depends upon the tastes of the, of the buyer. Um, and so here we see a portrait in the, uh, in the left of Sally Staymates from 1927. Um, in the center, Francis Fiske Marshall from 1929. And to the right, uh, a famous uh, portrait of John B. Turner Pioneer from 1928 slash 1930. He went back in and reworked that surface. Um, and this required Grant Wood to think a little bit differently. Um, he you know, wanted these portraits to look like the people um, that he was commissioned to paint. Uh, and similarly, also from the same time period, uh, Master Gordon Fennell from 1929, uh, Woman with Plants, which of course is a portrait of his mother from 1929, and Portrait of Judge Porter from around 1929. So um, now you can find elements of loose brushwork in some of these works. If you go, if you look very carefully at Woman with Plants, you look at her hands and you look at her face, there's still a little bit of loose brushwork there, but the rest of the composition um, ha has a different style to it. Um, and and there, again, part of it is portraiture, part of it is a few other um, factors that came to play um, for Grant Wood, one of which is this. The Veterans Memorial Window Commission from 27 to 29 was another factor happening in the late 20s, like the commissions, like the portraits, that caused Grant Wood uh, to change his style a bit. I'm talking about the window itself. Um, uh, because when you think about commissioning or creating a window, it requires the artist to approach the subject matter in a different way. Okay. This is not pigment on canvas or pigment on board. Uh, this instead is glass, glass that's held in place by leading. Okay. So all of a sudden, here's a drawing um, of, the, of the Revolutionary War soldier. Um, and uh, it's a life-size drawing, it's a two-scale drawing, the drawings that Grant Wood took with him when he went to Germany for the fabrication of the window. Um, and you, he, he has to conceive of the edges of every part of this figure with firm lines. All of a sudden that painterly looseness has to go because the glass has to be held in place by leading. Um, and so you, when he thinks about where there's a color shift, like from the uniform to the hands or from the hands to the rifle um, or from the uniform to the buttons, he has to surround that with leading. That ha has to be held in place with leading. So all of a sudden, in a painting, he might daub a little bit of oil paint uh, in yellow to create the buttons, but not in the piece of stained glass. That requires a completely different concept. And, and so at the same time that he's doing these portraits um, and, and trying to create a very naturalistic, very realistic view of the sitter, he's also um, required in, in the stained glass um, uh, commission to, to tighten up his edges, to firm up his edges. Um, and that's um, a pivotal part. Now, many people jump over the window and we'll hear a lot more about the window next week, uh, I believe. But people tend to jump over the window because they, they tend to be very, very interested in talking about how going abroad to a place other than France was important to Grant Wood, and, and it absolutely was. It absolutely was, but it's not the only part. I think this trip to Germany, in combination with the actual creation of the stained glass window, in combination with the portraits, in combination with other commissions, all set the scene for Grant Wood's evolution in his style. So now he's in a different place. He's not in France, he's in Germany. What did he see? He sees art that's very, very different. Um, and, you know, he was knowledgeable about other artwork 
um, you know, he's much more attuned to the art world than people have give, generally give him credit for. Um, but um, seeing these works firsthand, and he even calls out the artist Hans Memling by name as being influential. And that's who you see uh, on the left. Uh, this is not a piece that he would have seen in Germany. This is actually uh, Hans Memling's Man with the Roman Medal uh, and the Royal Museum in Antwerp. And it dates to around 1480, so very, very old work. Um, but uh, it's very typical of Memling's work, uh, a sitter holding an attribute in front of, a, in front of an open uh, landscape with a graded sky. Um, and this kind of formula, if you will, becomes very influential. Uh, uh, for him uh, in combination with the other things. In the center, Roger van der Weyden's Mary Magdalene in the Louvre um, from earlier, from around 1450. And on the right, Jan van Eyck's Arnold Feeney portrait um, in the National Gallery in London uh, from 1434. So all 15th century uh, works of art, these were kind of a revelation to see firsthand. They were so painstakingly painted with extraordinary details, so very different than what Grant Wood had been doing in Impressionism, it really, uh, it really excited him. Um, and he adopts certain aspects of this when he comes back um, to, uh, to the United States. This formula of, uh, of a figure holding an attribute in front of an open landscape against a graded sky is what he does in one of the first pieces he does when he comes back to the United States, which is Wilmer Plants. So he's in Germany in the fall of 28, um, and then he creates Wilmer Plants in 29. And you can see how this work, how Wilmer Plants relates so very much to Hans Menlin's work. And it's not a big jump from 1929 to 1930. Um, basically, uh, American Gothic is Wilmer Plants times two. Uh, where you've got two figures, again, holding an attribute against, you know, sort of an open landscape. The sky's a little more graded than you see here, but it is sort of a, a graded sky. Um, but now you've got two figures um, instead of one. And this painting, too, if you have the chance to be in front of it, look closely at the hands and the face, just like Woman with Plants. Um, there are elements of this painting that are still a little bit impressionistic, but on the whole, we're looking at a completely different style um, in, his, in his work. And so it's not hard once he sort of sets this down kind of in, in not, yeah, sort of into stone to see how he goes from that to this, um, you know, the next year with appraisal, which is at the Dubuque Museum, um, or Parson Weems' Fable um, from later uh, in the decade, from 1939 at the, at the uh, Eamon Carter um, in Fort Worth. And that's how he's doing this with figure. What is he doing with landscape? Because as we say, regionalism is largely a landscape oriented uh, phenomenon. This is over mantle decoration from 1930, the same year as American Gothic, exact same year. Um, and here we see a very different concept of landscape, certainly different than the American Impressionist style he had been working in, in before. Um, so, so where did this come from? We know kind of where the figures come from. You see the Hans Memling, and you think, okay, and the figures in, in the stained glass window and, 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 and the portraits he had been doing. What about the landscape? So overall, the shape, of course, I never miss an opportunity to say the overall round old shape uh, and this sort of focus on, on the old, you know, stay mate's house comes, you know, directly out of old maps. And so when you see this uh, wonderful map of Lynn County behind John B. Turner Pioneer, um, along the borders um, are these wonderful little roundels um, of, of notable sites in, uh, to see. Um, so the overall concept comes from old maps. This is a mid 19th century map that Turner actually owned and that we own now um, in, in the museum collection. But in, in at actual sort of uh, styling, it's coming again from Hans Memling and Northern Renaissance painting. Here, I've zoomed in on this same portrait uh, of a man with a Roman medal um, to look at the background that you see over his shoulders. And you can see that the artist um, has simplified the landscape forms um, into these kind of rounded tree shapes that are picked out with tiny little highlights with a very, very small brush. 
Um, and so you see uh, in the image, the detail on the left, where these sort of, it's almost like a lot of little tiny balls that have been uh, joined together um, in, in this, uh, uh, in, to create uh, the appearance uh, of, of a tree. Uh, and, and that's uh, also what you find in the Roger van der Weyden um, from even earlier in the 15th century. You can see it's the details. The landscape has been simplified. The rolling hills have been simplified. The tree forms have been simplified. Um, and you know, the individual leaves are picked out with tiny little highlights, but they're not all individually you know, painted individual leaves. And so it's not hard to see why or how Grant Wood would adopt that in um, over mantle decoration in 1930, um, but also in, uh, in Stone City uh, uh, from the same time. Uh, again, simplified landscape forms, rolling hills, rounded rolling hills, um, and, and the this, this simplified, almost geometricized um, tree forms uh, that populate that landscape, um, or all the more so in young corn, from 1931. Um, again, this wonderfully simplified um, uh, and geometricized uh, landscape, uh, which is just, just flowing. It's, it is in itself sort of poetic. Um, it's a poetic landscape um, and just has wonderful movement. He's very careful about how he moves you through the composition, um, but the forms themselves are coming right out of, uh, I think, Northern Renaissance painting. Again, here from a little bit uh, from uh, the same year, a uh, Midnight Ride of Paul Revere um, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Again, simplifies forms both in, in the architecture as well as in the landscape. And then you see towards the end of his career, um, these, these landscape forms persist. Um, he continues them on, but when you get to these, these works, and if you look carefully at that most of, of Grant Wood's mature style works, you know, really from kind of from really 1929 forward. Um, if you look closely, especially in, because you can, you know, spring in the country, you can see that it's made up of tiny, tiny little dots of paint. Um, it's almost impressionistic. Um, he has not completely forgotten his roots in American impressionism, um, but he has taken those little dots and he has put them under the control of the, of the, of the simplified rolling, uh, hills, which are which are the rolling landscapes, which you see in Iowa, um, and he's he's seeing it and, and and saw it echoed in the kind of uh, way that painters were were depicting the landscape in the Northern Renaissance, and he he combines both that experience of seeing them in in other painters and seeing it for real in real life into into his compositions, and so that I think is. Um, some of the factors, some of the influences that uh, demonstrate how Grant Wood moved from, uh, from American Impressionism to what we would call his, his mature style. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much. I, I just, oh. You just really drew these lines so clearly for us to see, and it's just so that's just so neat. Um, because you know, when you if you pull up Grant Wood, you just see this array of paintings that are scattered all over the country. You don't necessarily think of that evolution or that are connected and what the practical realities of his life were. Does anybody have any questions for Sean? I, I could rhapsodize too long. So let's. Um. I did I notice I my audience since the submission, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> Don't be afraid to speak. I'm just unmute if you do that. Well, I have one. It's not, it's, uh, it's, it's so minuscule and unimportant, but the trees, his, his glob globular, rounded 
I didn't see that. That's not Northern Renaissance. That's not Impressionist. It's just, it seems to be uh, his own thing. I don't know. Is that I think you can, I think you get a hint of it in some of the backgrounds of the Northern Renaissance paintings. I, you know, when I show that detail of the Hans Memling, um, they were kind of rounded trees, but inside there, they were kind of ball-like inside. Now he takes it to a whole nother level. Yeah. Um, but I do have to say, you know, uh, living in Iowa, there is a moment in the spring when trees do look like the way Grandwood paints them. Um, I don't know whether it's uh, a particular type of tree, um, but I know, you know, when I'll be driving in and all of a sudden, just like I was, you know, jam on the brakes when I see a Marvin Cohn cloud, I'll jam on the brakes when I see um, a Grantwood tree. Um, because there are moments, and, and I really should have a camera with me when that happens, um, uh, and pull over to the side of the road and take pictures, where in the right light, they do look like the, the series of connected balls um, of, uh, of leaves. It, and it's usually in the springtime, and I want to say it's mostly in maples, but I could, could be wrong about that. Um, so despite all of those art historical precedences, there is the natural landscape, which I think Grant Wood was very attuned to uh, and was paying attention to. So you, I have seen it. I know it exists. Um, so I, I think he's, he's doing both. I think he's looking at art, but he's also looking at the world around him. Uh, for sure. Now we have a question from the chat um, from Barb. Um, you made a reference to what sounded to her like graded sky. Oh, yes, a graded sky. Yeah, G-R-A-D-E-D. -E -D. What I meant by that was a sky that kind of goes from light to dark. It kind of, it, you know, that where you, where it gets lighter at the horizon because you're looking through more um, humidity in the atmosphere. So the blue pales out, basically. Um, so when you're looking sort of at the horizon line, you're actually looking through more uh, moisture in the air. And so it looks paler. So I'm uh, sorry for my enunciation, but yeah, graded. Okay. And. Question, and I, okay? Oh, go for it, Ignacio. Welcome. Hi, Sean. I'm new to this uh, to this forum, but it's very exciting. I'm a huge uh, fan of uh, Grant Wood. I love your talk, Sean. It was very, very interesting. And um, and I want to ask you something. Uh, in my research of Grant Wood, one thing that I read is that once he adapted or adopted uh, the regionalist style, he became very dismissive or critical of his previous impressionistic style he kind of detached himself from it as if he had never been part of it. And I even read that he called it wrist, wrist work, as if he was not manly enough, the style. Is that, I would like to hear your thoughts on that. If it's true that he, in a way, wanted to detach himself from it once he became a regionalist. I, I have not read that source. I mean, I haven't seen that um, in, in the writings on him. But if you look at his later works, it's still there. It's still there in part. Now, artists famously say one thing and do another, um, you know, and that's their prerogative. Uh, so uh, so I, I don't know. He could be, he could absolutely have said that. But if you look at the painting, if you look at the evidence, um, you know, you can see elements. If you look at Autumn Oaks, um, which is a, a work from the 30s. Um, and, and there's all kinds of wonderful um, uh, geometricized um, uh, landscape. But if you look, that grass is put in like any good impressionist. Um, it's still there. It's still there. And, and like you see in this last work, you know, in, in one of its last works, Spring in the Country, um, where, you know, you just, there's tiny little daubs of paint there very, very thinly and carefully, carefully, painstakingly put, on, put in. Um, uh, that, that really sort of references something outside of, of, of what he had kind of developed into. He still, still some of those antecedents uh, are, are there. Um, I, I, you know, I, again, don't know the exact quote um, or exactly what he was saying or in what context, but, um, but yeah, you know, he, 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 that work was well collected by people that mattered to him. So I, I think that, you know, he didn't, he probably wouldn't have wanted to be too, too dismissive of it because they were still important collectors of his. Um, but, um, but yeah, he may have felt, I did that. 
I took impressionism as far as I could go with it. And I needed to find something new, something new and challenging. And he found, he definitely found that because I mean, his productivity uh, with this new style was much uh, lower because it was much slower to do. Um, so, so his productivity fell off dramatically. Um, plus he was teaching, you know, at the university and it was uh, with the WPA. He had lots of polls on his time um, in the thirties, um, but his, his productivity just is a painstakingly different style. And uh, it, just, it just takes longer to create those works. You cannot go at it um, with the quickness that you can, I think, with an impressionistic work. But, 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 but to be truthful, I mean, there's good impressionism and there's bad impressionism. I mean, it's not, it's not that, you know, uh, uh, that he just, that it was faster. He was good at it. That's the other thing. He was really good at it. And the second thing I want to say is I just read recently a thesis from an, um, a writer called Luciano Cellis. I don't know if you're familiar with his. Yeah. And he was, it was very, it was very interesting to read about um, his take on how Wood was influenced by Italian Renaissance, um, particularly by Peter La Francesca, um, the resurrection on American Gothic and the Last Supper on the Dinner for Treasures. So that was very interesting to see because we always read about the German, uh, the Northern Renaissance, but it was interesting to see that he was probably also influenced by the traditional Italian Renaissance artists like uh, Piero da Francesca. So I just wanted to mention that. And 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 he, you know, Luciano maybe uh, might be right. I um, uh, haven't studied that to a great degree. I mean, we know that Grant Wood was in Germany. I mean, he was in Italy, but ever so briefly on a break between classes when he was taking classes. Um, we know he was in Germany. We know he singled out Hans Memling by name. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why we kind of kind of gravitate towards that. But by the same token, um, uh, if you look at the sketchbook for um, the stained glass window, um, in there is a, is a drawing that I think is, is a drawing of uh, Michelangelo's Pietà. He's trying to figure out the compositional arrangement for the window. One of the antecedents that he um, was looking at was um, uh, was the uh, was Michelangelo's Pietà. Now, um, he would not have seen that firsthand at the time he was doing the sketchbook. Um, that would have been something he probably sketched out of a book, um, yeah. but he was interested in that relationship. Um, of how does one memorialize somebody or some yeah, somebody that has passed away? Um, and that's a great uh, uh, sculpture that does that. He was trying to do something evocative of that same thing um, with the window. Okay. Thank you. I have a question. Um, Sean, you showed us an early freeze that uh, Grant Wood did with students. I was wondering if there were any other examples of collaborative work. Um, there is some early, um, um, there's some early metal work um, that, that he did. Um, and a lot of what he did actually, I mean, when it came to the metal work, a lot of that was collaborative. Um, and so he was used to working with other artists. Um, but uh, generally speaking, when it came to kind of painting, um, it was usually just him. Okay. And, and speaking of metalwork, Sean, when, when did he stop doing metalwork? Do you know? He continued through the 20s um, to do metalwork um, and mostly in the kind of designing it and then other people would fabricate. Um, so, so that continued well into the 20s. I, I imagine it goes into the 30s too. You know, Paul Jewell, who's on this call, might know because he's he's looked uh, a little bit more at, at at the later. He might have been doing it well into the into the 30s. Is that right, Paul? Uh, I'm really not sure on that, Sean. Um, but I would think what you're saying is right is correct. But I I couldn't verify that. I think you had a couple uh, when you did your presentation on unrealized projects. Yeah, right. um, I think I think there was some wasn't there some metal in that or some ideas from metal. He was never. I think he kept thinking about it. I think it was important yeah. design element throughout his career. Yeah, well, certainly uh, some architectural concepts there too with the Danforth Chapel and some things such as that. Uh, it wasn't totally his 
projection wasn't totally at, at painting, so that's for sure. Um, and I'd speak. I, oh, oh, sorry. I, I have an, another comment though, too, Sean. Uh, kudos, first of all, for such a wonderful presentation. I, I always learn so much when I hear you talk, and I'm sure most everyone that's tuned in uh, is thinking that same thing right now. But I also, when you were talking about uh, Midwest spring and the rounded trees, I think of another Midwesterner here that I see some a common ground with Grant Wood, and that would be a guy from Missouri named Walt Disney. And in some of uh, Disney's early work, Fantasia and some of that, you see those same rounded tree concepts uh, and some very similar backgrounds. So I throw that out for your comment. Oh, absolutely right. Uh, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because Disney, of course, also went to Germany, you know, sent his people to Germany to find these old tales um, to, 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 to illustrate. So it's interesting that they're kind of coming about. But yeah, that and the aerial perspective, you know, as a lot of Disney cartoons began with sort of a bird's eye view or a bird flying in. Um, and you see that in the work. You see that in Young Horn. You know, you're hovering above the ground. You're not standing on the ground. You're not firmly planted on the ground. You see that in Marvin Cohn as well, um, where you have this kind of bird's eye view. That is very much akin uh, with Disney. And as long as we're talking about Disney, we need to talk about Dr. Seuss. Um, he was creating at the same time. And a lot of his forms look exactly like what Grant Wood and Walt Disney are doing. Um, so yeah, there's there's something there. And I, it probably must have been 10, 12 years ago. I don't know if it ever came to pass, but there was a museum in France that wanted to do a show on Walt Disney and they wanted to borrow Grant Wood for it. Um, because they saw what you're seeing, that there's this interesting kind of synergy between, between the two sort of visions of, of, uh, of the world. Uh, of, the, of that simplified form. Well, I know that Walt Disney uh, was a fan of Grant Woods because I do have in one of the publications a photo of Walt Disney and his daughter in front of a television set. And on the wall right behind it is one of Grant Woods uh, lithographs. I remember that photo from your presentation, yes. And Walt Disney was from Kansas City, so that whole regional thing too was operating. Mm -hmm. And Paul, to your comment about some of his later architectural unrealized things, um, I again refer to the, um, the sketchbook for the Veterans Memorial window. In there, you'll see that he sketched out a lot of architectural features, which I don't think made it to the final uh, inclusion in the building. Um, I'll let people more familiar with the building know if there's some tucked away places where, where, where these designs for lamp posts and, and, and that sort of thing um, actually appear. But he was, he was a man who was interested in so many different things um, at, at, the same, at the same time. And yet time or history has really kind of pigeonholed him into one thing. You know, he was a regionalist painter being, you know, period, it's over. But he was actually uh, a, a much more complicated uh, man and a much more complicated artist, um, both, than, than I think history has allowed him to be. Oh my goodness. Well, this is, this is just so fascinating. And I think you gave us, you know, Don, you provided us with some wonderful ideas and tools for creative writing response. Sean, you gave us this context that just is spectacular. And I am, I am hoping that you guys will, will all really think seriously about putting pen to paper or pen to digital something, something to share with us on the 28th. So um, we, we, there's time to pull that sort of things together. We've got a, a session next week, uh, of course, with Terry and Barbara about the, the stained glass window, which will be fascinating and wonderful. And then we'll have a week off and then we'll come together and you can share some of your inspirations with all of us. And, and it'll be interesting to, it'll just be so fascinating to see what inspires everybody um, between now and then. Um, I can't 
thank you enough, Don and Sean. Um, going once, going twice on any questions here, folks. <laughs> Elaine, you were going to give us your uh, email address or some contact oh. you said at the beginning. Oh, yeah, that slide came and went. Sorry. Uh, I just put it in the in the chat and okay, the chat. I and I don't, I don't know if it's included in the weekly, in the weekly emails you get from the library, but I could ask her to do that too. But I just put it in there. I'll give you a second. Um, and so, of course, later in the series, we're going to hear from Dorothy Bunny Montgomery. We're going to hear from Paul Jewell as well. And uh, so, just things keep chugging along. Uh, Oh, the library said they'll include my email in the next in the next communications if you if you don't have a chance to catch it here. So, well, it's past eight o'clock, and our uh, our wonderful library hosts, you know, there's life there's life after the library closes, <laughs> but we want our libraries to stay open and vibrant. So appreciate them. Thank you again so much. See you all next week. I hope. Yes, great.